Hello and welcome to Carmelite Conversations. This is Francis Harry and I have a little surprise for you. It is a talk on the glories of Saint Joseph. In the Discount Carmelite uh, secular community that I'm in, we're doing a series of presentations on Saint Joseph. And I thought that you might enjoy this one that I gave recently. And so I hope you find it um, inspiring and also challenging to help you imitate the glorious Saint Joseph. And with that, let's take a listen. I'd like to start with an opening prayer to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come by way of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Enlighten our minds, enkindle our hearts. Help us to know and do your will. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Francesca was going to talk about family history, um, but since she uh, had an operation on July the 10th, I believe, she was not up to putting everything together, and so I said I would step in for her. Um, but I found a topic that I could find more research materials on handy in just the time I had. So it's the glories of St. Joseph. Um, his name in Hebrew, by the way, means God will add or increase. And I'm thinking of this in terms of Joseph's increasing glory. In the context, the word glory itself denotes the condition of highest praise, splendor, radiant beauty or magnificence, or the bliss of heaven. I am choosing to speak on seven of the glories of St. Joseph, but by no means is that all. So I'm just going to highlight seven. Now, we know, was he not a person chosen and set apart? With Mary, he had an eminently special role to play because after Mary, it was through him after all and under his guidance that Christ was introduced into the world for the work of redemption. St. Joseph stands between the Old and the New Testament. In him, the line of patriarchs and prophets are brought to fulfillment. What was offered as a promise to them, St. Joseph held in his very arms. So I'd like to start with the first glory of St. Joseph, and that was his conception. Notice I said conception, not birth. His conception. St. Joseph was probably born without original sin. Now hear me out. Not conceived without sin, but born without sin. This difference there. It is an article of faith, of course, that the Blessed Virgin Mary, by singular privilege, was prevented and preserved entirely from original sin. That's a, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. There are other souls in Scripture, however, through divine predilection, were sanctified before they were born. For instance, we would think St. John the Baptist, right? The fathers of the church agree that St. Joseph surpasses all the other saints in dignity and sanctity. We are free to conjecture, although it is not in Scripture, nor is it opposed to Scripture, that St. Joseph was sanctified before birth. For all the holy doctors agreed that there was no grace given to any other saint except the Blessed Virgin Mary, which was not granted to St. Joseph. For the sake of Jesus and Mary, we may deduce that St. Joseph must have been given a privilege second only to Mary. Additionally, we know that those whom God designates for great work, he also prepares and equips them with the corresponding gifts and graces for their calling to fulfill their mission. Also, it would be fitting for, for Joseph as the father on earth for the son of God who came to take away the sin of the world that he should have the stain of original sin on his soul. So it's not appropriate for St. Joseph to have the stain of sin. So one may rightly conclude that St. Joseph was sanctified in the womb. And even that, God would have prepared for Joseph the greatest grace of sanctification after Mary. 
Some argue he was sanctified the first second after his conception. Well, I don't know how we tell that, but anyway. <laughs> Next to Mary, Joseph had the most sublime ministry, a ministry superior to that of all the holy angels and the saints. Well, because the holy angels had the office of guardianship of men, but to Joseph was committed a far higher and more excellent office since he was chosen to be the guardian of Christ the Lord, God and man, and to be the most faithful spouse of his mother, Mary. Now, I didn't make all this up, so this is the research I've done, and I believe that I am speaking according to uh, the, the teachers of our faith. So I thought that that would be something new for you to consider. The second glory I want to address is St. Joseph's fidelity to grace. By this is meant that St. Joseph's awareness of sanctifying grace in his soul, his desire to increase sanctifying grace. Are you aware of sanctifying grace in your soul? Are you thinking of ways of increasing sanctifying grace in your soul? It also refers to his ardent cooperation with the actual graces that God sent to him constantly. Graces that enlightened his mind and moved his will to do good and to avoid evil. And we get those too, right? <laughs> Essentially, it was his positive response to the workings of the Holy Spirit. Now, for the next few minutes, I'm going to draw from the Reflections for a Novena to St. Joseph by a sister, Emily Joseph. She says, St. Joseph, with his eye firmly fixed on his final goal, responded with generous heart and ready will to the gentlest breathing of the Holy Spirit. His entire life was stamped with loving, ready consent to the movements of grace. God had his designs for St. Joseph, although they were not made clear to him at the beginning. Because he accepted each grace as it was given in the moment, the beauty of his soul increased from day to day. Finally, in God's time, he was ready to become the spouse of the mother of God and the foster father of the guardian of her child. The Holy Spirit is the source of all grace. The church teaches us to pray to him for grace, which will act as a light for the soul. In this light, we clearly see many things, God's goodness, our own weakness and our need of him, the meaning of life, the vanity of this world's goods, and that true happiness, peace, and rest are not to be had in this life, but are reserved for us in heaven. St. Joseph's soul, we can assume, was flooded with the light of the Holy Spirit. He did not turn away from the brightness of this light, like an eagle that can gaze steadily into the sun as it flies higher and higher. St. Joseph kept his eyes open to the divine light. His steadfastness and courage were rewarded. To him was granted the incomparable privilege to look each day for years upon the son of justice who called him father. But many times, anxiety clouded St. Joseph's life. Consider the time Our Lady made no mention to him of the visit of the Archangel Gabriel. Consequently, St. Joseph was deeply upset and tortured by almost unbearable doubts and fears regarding her pregnancy until the angel told him, Do not be afraid to take your wife Mary to yourself for it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that she conceived this child. Here we can see the Holy Spirit is the divine consoler. Well, St. Joseph really did need someone to console him and comfort him in this distress of his heart and to guide him in the proper action that he should take. He didn't turn to friends, neighbors, or even relatives. He turned to God first in prayer, and the grace was given to him, and he acted faithfully immediately and this, uh, as the grace directed him. In return for his fidelity to grace, he became the chaste guardian of the Virgin Mary and the watchful defender of Christ. Quite simply, we must 
be faithful to the graces of the Holy Spirit. Just as precision instruments can safely guide a pilot through dangerous fog and storm, so the mind and will of St. Jo Joseph, responding sensitively to the movements of grace, gave balance and direction to his life and prevented him from exceeding that perfect moderation which constitutes virtue. So think of this for a minute. Thank God and ask through St. Joseph to be faithful to all the graces he sends you and pray frequently to the Holy Spirit. This leads to the third glory, St. Joseph's fidelity to an eminently virtuous interior life. The interior life is the life of the soul, the life of grace in the soul, the life of awareness of God and devotion to duty for the honor and glory of God. It also embraces the practice of virtue, which is associated with living the interior life, such as the spirit of prayer, the continual remembrance of the presence of God, resignation to God's will, humility of heart, the spirit of sacrifice, and like things that we should know about here in Carmel, right? Things that we talk about in our meetings. The interior life of St. Joseph sprang from his special relationship with each of the three divine persons. He was the shadow of the eternal father, the legal spouse of Mary, who had conceived by the Holy Spirit, and the foster father of the Son of God. Only a man rooted in deep humility could accept these overwhelming truths. Think of it if the Lord called you right now to do what Mary or Joseph did. It's amazing. Each of them supplied him with thoughts too profound for words. Even as the gospel tells us that Mary treasured all these things in her heart, St. Joseph did too. He did not turn aside from, um, he did turn aside from outward things to consider these mysteries in the depths of his soul. You know, distractions that plague us and avert our gaze from God had the opposite effect with him. He was single eye focus. He was quiet and undisturbed. From the perfect order which characterized his interior life proceeded that tranquility, which is true peace. And not that he wasn't tested, as I mentioned earlier, with the angel talking to the Blessed Mother and not to him. But he discerned, he made a choice, and then if the choice wasn't the right one, the Lord gave him the direction. Because he was a poor man, St. Joseph faced financial problems, which we can identify with. To many people, money, its acquisition and its use, is such a preoccupation that they find little time to consider God, his love and goodness, and his care for his children. But such was not the case with St. Joseph. He acted simply and uncomplainingly the fact of his poverty. In fact, the mystics say that Joseph and Mary cherished poverty. He labored diligently so that his family might have the necessities of life, but he paid no attention to luxuries. What if we did that? Paid no attention to luxuries. He understood that one can serve God equally well in poverty or in wealth. He knew, too, from his experience at Bethlehem that the Son of God, who had all heaven at his disposal, had chosen poverty. In imitation of this divine model, St. Joseph, too, became a lover of poverty. Sooner or later, we know every family has trials. Well, the Holy Family was no exception. Consider this trial, the loss of your son. <laughs> When they lost the child Jesus after their visit to Jerusalem when he was just 12 years old, just imagine the agonizing uh, emotion that Our Lady had when she realized the, um, the situation. Imagine, too, the additional anguish which rent the heart of St. Joseph, the divinely chosen head of the Holy Family. Well, those were their natural reactions. And it's only right that they would feel that way because they had responsibility for the child Jesus. Yet, Joseph did not waste time in useless self-accusation, nor in seeking or offering explanations. He took the next right step, and he looked for Jesus. 
If it were God's will that he and Mary should suffer this tragic loss, he would accept that will silently and patiently because God's will is what dominated his life. Do we do this? His anxiety, far from causing him distraction, drew him closer to God, inspired greater trust in his providence, cast him more completely upon his support. Even though his heart was full of sorrow, as the gospel tells us, his life was Christ-centered, and his will firmly anchored in the will of God. Distress of heart need not interfere with fidelity to the interior life. Rather, as St. Joseph shows us, it should increase that interior spirit, emphasizing that all things are passing. God alone suffices. The complete sacrifice of St. Joseph's entire life to the demands of the coming of the Messiah into his home finds its true motive in his unfathomable, unfathomable interior life. He was a miracle of holiness. So let's ask St. Joseph to, for the grace to be faithful to our interior life. The fourth glory, Jesus, I mean, Joseph chosen as the spouse of Mary. Think of that. Consider this. Mary, here she is, the golden ladder, the stairway to heaven by which God wishes to come down to mankind and draw mankind to him. Although Mary belonged totally to God, the Lord saw fit that Mary should become the spouse of a man, a human man, and that would be St. Joseph. How amazing is this? God's plan was to give a mortal man lawful rights over the blessed and immaculate Mary. In this act alone, the perfectly chaste St. Joseph was chosen and is the most favored among all men. And as in a double portion, which you know we Carmelites like to find, Joseph had not only Mary, but also Jesus, the Son of God, always before his eyes. We see in St. Joseph a totally purified soul, a soul in which sin has lost its power. St. Augustine, while asserting that no one, the Blessed Mother accepted, is ever free from sin in this life, and that even the saints must pray, forgive us our sins, recognize that God could, if he so desired, by way of exception and special privilege, completely take away the corruption which causes a man to sin and array him with incorruptibility in this life so that he might see God everywhere present, just as the saints in heaven see him, but without a veil. Surely this marvelous privilege was granted to St. Joseph. And wouldn't St. Joseph have been completely taken up in unceasing contemplation of his God and the Immaculate Mary? It's no wonder he was so silent. How could he speak with him? He was in such deep contemplation. How could he sin? In the holy house of Nazareth, there was no room for sin. That leads us to the fifth glory, the great dignity of St. Joseph as the just one. Can we even fathom what it must have been like for St. Joseph to see Jesus and Mary at his feet? showing the most loving signs of respect. I mean, they had a contest. Who could be the most humble and the most loving, right? <laughs> Joseph must have been the greatest person ever to have lived, and this not because of the great lineage of 14 kings and many patriarchs and leaders, but because of his glorious title as the Just One. For this, he will be admired for all time. The Holy Father of the Church, St. Maximus of Turin, asked, do you wish to know why Joseph was called just? And I ask you, do you wish to know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here's the answer. It is because he possessed perfectly all the virtues. Now that's a, that's a father of the church talking, not me. What more could one say about a man than to say that he possesses all the virtues to a perfect degree? 
Is this not the highest praise? And who could compare himself in grandeur to Joseph? Well, you might say Adam. Well, Adam, before the fall, appeared with all the animals subject to him, right? Or what about Moses, who commanded creatures with his rod? And Abraham, surrounded by the, his descendants like the sands on the seashore? Oh, and what about Solomon? He had queens prostrate before his throne. Well, all of these powers do not make them equal to St. Joseph, no. For they receive these powers and virtues only in part, while St. Joseph had them all, and he had them all to a perfect degree. And that leads to the sixth glory, the glory of the suffering and death of St. Joseph. And I turn to Venerable Mary of Agrida from the City of God for help on this one. Many were the sufferings of the glorious St. Joseph, who entered the way of the cross with the utmost heroic virtues. Venerable Mary of Agrida was told that in the last years of St. Joseph's life, he was given certain sicknesses, such as fever, violent headaches, which I can relate to, and very painful rheumatisms, which greatly afflicted and weakened him. But all of this was to increase his merits and his crown before his death. So you see, your sufferings are opportunities for you to merit and to grow, to exercise virtue, you know, like patience, perseverance, <laughs> surrender. The most extreme and painful suffering, though sweet, came from the fire of his ardent love, which was so strong that the flights and ecstasies of his most pure soul would have burst asunder if the Lord had not strengthened and comforted him. It is said that St. Joseph never complained of any of his trials, nor ever asked relief in his wants and necessities, bearing all with the greatest equanimity of soul. In the end, the Lord withdrew his miraculous assistance by which St. Joseph's natural forces were enabled to withstand the violence of this flaming love. And guess what happened? He died. And he died of love. And for those of you who have studied the entire castle, St. Teresa of Avila talks about this dying, this kind of dying of love. Having created and destined St. Joseph for such a high purpose and vocation, it is certain that God, in his almighty power, prepared and perfected him in proportion to the exaltedness of his end. And at last God called him, saying, Good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. It is argued by many theologians that St. Joseph was probably taken body and soul into heaven upon his death. Yes, I just said that. <laughs> St. Joseph was probably taken body and soul to heaven upon his death. What a glorious death to have died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Now let me, let me expand on this just a little bit because this was news to me. Okay, first of all, have any of you seen a first class relic of St. Joseph? No, there are none. There are second class relics, however, of his robe. But there are no first class relics. In fact, there's no first class relics of the Virgin Mary either. And it's a the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, there are no first class. There's no bones, right? Of course, we know the Blessed Mother was assumed into heaven. Um, but the same reasoning can be applied, possibly, to the body of St. Joseph. Just as an aside, there is a wedding ring that is attributed to be the one St. Joseph gave to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it's preserved at the Cathedral Church of San Lorenzo in Perugia, Italy. And it's not gold or any kind of metal, but it's a type of quartz. There's a, you can look for it online and there's a picture. And uh, so there's claims that that is so. Well, we don't have any definite uh, opinion on that. St. Francis de Sales, now here I am, I'm talking about a doctor of the church. He considers it definite that St. Joseph was taken body and soul into heaven after his death. Many such saints look to Genesis chapter, um, chapter 50, verse 25, as a prophecy. 
And this is where Joseph is saying to his brothers in Egypt, when God thus takes care of you, you must bring my bones up with you from this place. Well, common sense dictates, would God let his own foster father rot in the ground until his second coming? Indeed, some theologians argue that even though we know that Mary's assumption was unique, Mary was not the only one taken body and soul into heaven for a preemptive resurrection of the body. I'm like, what? <laughs> and they cite these scriptures. Um, Genesis 5, verse tw uh, 24, Enoch. 2 Kings 2, 11, Elijah, which we know was carried through a, a, a flaming chariot. Matthew 27, verse 53, the souls coming forth from their tombs at the resurrection of Jesus. This is something to ponder. I'm not saying this is factual. I'm just saying you what some of the doctors of the church are saying for us to consider. The St. Joseph should be among this small party of bodies in heaven. It's easy to believe when you consider that St. Joseph has been defined doctrinally by the magisterium as the second greatest saint. Mary, of course, being the first. This leads me to the final glory that I want to um, pinpoint, and that is St. Joseph and the future. The church's theology is that Mary lived as the exemplar, the supreme goal and example of the church. This means that everything St. Joseph did for Mary, he would do now for the church at large. So now it's easy to understand why St. Joseph would be guarding and protecting the church in her pilgrim state here on this earth. He is summoned to protect the church from both theological error and real demons. We need to call on him now more than ever in this time of really uh, unprecedented confusion within the church and diabolical attack within the family, the domestic church. And so we pray, you know, St. Joseph, terror of, demons, terror of demons, come to our aid. And he's ready to help us. God invites us to take note of St. Joseph, a father unlike any other human father, one who surpasses every other father. It is St. Joseph that God now gives to the world in a special way to obtain its healing and for its return to the hands of its creator. As the love and devotion to St. Joseph intensifies and grows, and you hear more and more about St. Joseph in our days, we come closer to the longed-for triumph of Mary prophesied at Fatima. In summary, here are the seven glories of St. Joseph that were pointed out. The glory of his conception, his fidelity to grace, his virtuous interior life, his being chosen as the husband of Mary, the dignity of the just one, his glorious suffering and death, and his role in the future. So I offer you a spiritual challenge. Ponder the glories of St. Joseph and also how you yourself glorify the Lord. And so at this point I'd like to close with a prayer that starts with the words of St. John Paul II and then continues in a consecration. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Most beloved Father, St. Joseph, dispel the evil of falsehood and sin. Graciously assist us from heaven in our struggle and with the powers of darkness. And just as once you saved the child Jesus from mortal danger, so now defend God's holy church from the snares of her enemies and from all adversity. Blessed St. Joseph, we consecrate ourselves to your honor and gives ourselves to you that you may always be our father, our protector, and our guide in the way of salvation. Obtain for us great purity of heart and a fervent love of the interior life. After your example, may we perform our actions for the greater glory of God in union with the divine heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. Pray for us, St. Joseph, that we may experience the peace and joy of your holy death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd just like to recommend for anyone who would like to delve into the glories of St. Joseph, there's a couple books by that same title. 
One is the glories of St. Joseph. Another one is the life and glories of St. Joseph. I'm sure if you do an a internet search, you'll come across them, but um, it's thick. <laughs> Thank you.